Good morning traders, welcome to FreeFX. Today is the 5th of December 2015. I've uh, uh, finally decided to um, <clears throat> invest in um, a pro account with uh, screencast o -Matic. So you will have <clears throat> a, an extra feature length today. Um, this will be um, a longer video than the usual 15 minutes. So just be prepared that um, <clears throat> I will try to uh, use this uh, to explain a few more things. I haven't uh, actually made a disclaimer um, for today's video and would like to get stuck in uh, straight away so just beware of uh, taking this too, uh, too literally as trading advice. It's not. Um, so first of all let me say that the, the video today is going to be about um, a number of things. Um, the central theme really is um, as always where we're going from here in terms of trading into next week and the end of the year and the second thing is what has happened in the last week so Monday to Friday what has been the the big news story the big pickup in um, interest in the market and volatility so what better way to start than uh, the euro US dollar except I decided not to um, because everybody probably starts with the euro US dollar I wanted to choose a different pair that comes off that um, spectrum if you like the euro US dollar or euro based pairs and I went to this pair which is the Kiwi Jap uh, Japanese yen now you can see that um, there is some degree of um, response to the European Central Bank's rate decision last Thursday and uh, this is the hourly chart and you can see it even on the daily chart that it was quite a move okay now it was quite a move and then um, on the non-farm payrolls day the Friday uh, which came out quite positive um, it was an even stronger move okay so let's try to put this into context. We have the Kiwi Yen and this currency pair has two bearings. Number one, it's a Kiwi pair, so it will respond to what the Kiwi does against the US dollar. And second, it's, um, a, a, it's a Yen cross and therefore it will respond to things like uh, the Yen, but also the carry trade. So the built up, um, trade based on cheap borrowing um, on a devalued yen so building up on that premium and uh, rollover with the Kiwi being the stronger of the two in terms of interest rate on the long side okay now we've come obviously up to these um, peaks which are not the same but getting pretty close by 500 odd pips to the 2007 8 peak. So we've come full circle, you might say. And then in 2015, that premium has somewhat depreciated. So from the uh, August crash, we have recovered some of this drop, um, but we struggle to return higher. Than these levels at um, 82.50.83, except perhaps on Friday, but we saw it peaking forward. Now, I, I won't spend the video talking about the Kiwi yen, however, you can see that um, we are possibly looking at this pair and wondering what has happened um, for the Kiwi and the yen. To be influenced in any way by the European Central Bank rate decision, you know. Um, so looking at the hourly chart again, you will see when the uh, interest rate was announced and the QE program was um, upgraded to up to March of 2017. This was the move, which you know it's at 100 odd pips. It is not you know as big as other moves we saw on the day, but certainly. For a currency pair like this, which has been fairly quiet um, recently, it's not the uh, the quietest of moves. So if we had the average true range indicator telling us 
for example, that at the moment we have an average true range based on a two-week trading period uh, sitting at about 80 pips, okay, and on the day before the ECB rate decision, we were sitting at even lower, about a 72. Okay, and going back further to um, the last week in November, we were down at 66, 65. Okay, so these levels obviously are considering that we had a pickup after the August Chinese market crash, uh, are returning to what's quote unquote more normal for this this pair okay we've seen these levels before you know in June of 2015 again here in March so um, but they are certainly uh, levels that suggest that uh, a move out, uh, at 100 pips uh, within an hour would be perhaps the word unsustainable is what I would use for this pair so the influence that a move of that magnitude would carry on a pair that is not directly motivated by the euro or directly motivated by um, the uh, European Central Bank stimulus um, is obvious here. And indeed, if we look at the um, the move in the context of the daily chart, uh, we see that the candle, the hourly chart, seems so uh, reactive, but the candle on the day is indeed very narrow so even if we extended it it still looks very small it's that that much is quite quite obvious we have maybe a 25 pip body to this candle what is remarkable actually is what happened on the next day because the two uh, candles here are showing us the disconnect in a way between real uh, real facts if you like or real events and market expectation um, coming to the end of the year there are two there are two uh, situations playing out here one is that um, the US dollar which in turns uh, influences the Kiwi and other currencies and therefore the Kiwi yen the, the US dollar has been um, a remarkable uh, achiever this year um, and certainly in 2014 but we have come to um, in a way a stall where we're waiting for the next the next big announcement we all know what the big announcement is uh, we just ha haven't had it yet so uh, until we do it will be difficult to a position and b um, manage perhaps current trades or trying to see you know even just notionally where the markets will go to next now this is the um, overlay I've um, this is the Kiwi yen and this is the US dollar on the daily chart so you can see that um, they uh, obviously move in inverse correlation I say obviously because it may not be so obvious but um, the Kiwi side of yen is obviously influenced by the Kiwi side of of Kiwi US dollar. So, where the US dollar is strong, the Kiwi will drop, and so will the Kiwi yen. However, we have the we have a, a risk sensitive currency here, which means that generally um, a move that's fed not so much by perhaps uh, a currency move, but by a market sentiment move like um, uh, a drop in sentiment in one way or another in the markets generally whether it's equity driven or um, stocks or uh, China those moves would be um, more obvious perhaps in a pair like the Kiwi Yen than the Kiwi Dollar however the correlation remains uh, as inverse to the US dollar so we can see that what's remarkable here is that on the uh, Friday so following the ECB day um, we saw that uh, the dollar had a, a bit of a hard time on Friday to uh, to pick up and so the Kiwi Yen rose 
Let's have a look at it on the actual US dollar chart so we can see the candle as well. Um, so here it is. Now, that's very remarkable. What, what we see on the actual US dollar is that um, we wouldn't expect this to happen on a European Central Bank um, introducing QE. We wouldn't expect this to happen also in the US dollar which has an appeal as a safe haven currency, as currency um, to replace risky assets in a time of possibly risk aversion or certainly of uh, nervousness of, of, of markets. We wouldn't expect the dollar to drop at the same time as equities. When we look at the UK Financial Times and Stock Exchange, 100 shares index you see on the day again massive drop 225 points or more and the US dollar again big drop here from 12,200 to 12,075 uh, close so um, so very puzzling for two reasons one how is the US dollar um, positioned lower on a day that the ECB is devaluing its currency or was intending to devalue its currency potentially or expecting that of the markets. Well, the US dollar index is a weighted index so it will respond to moves in the euro, US dollar, pound, US dollar and other majors. So it is obvious that when we see what happened with the euro US dollar this down move will become easily explained so this is what happened on the day the ECB upgraded its stimulus so I, I'll say it again upgraded its stimulus not just by six months by 16 months to March of 2017 so essentially it's a QE program going to the future with the promise that as Draghi the president of the European Central Bank always says uh, the ECB will do whatever it takes so it um, it will do it will use a number of tools um, of which um, you know QE is is one but certainly it's a package and therefore um, it, one of the features of this package is the open-ended essentially upgrade although he didn't use that word but he said that in March 2017 is the deadline um, provided that goals are met if not then the ECB has the resources to continue further into the future if necessary so in a way um, we've had the announcement at half past one uh, GMT on Thursday from the president of the ECB that the QE program might continue into the future um, almost as an open-ended program should the um, Euro Eurozone not um, perform as well as it should by March 2017 and in a way um, by, by lowering the um, the lending rate um, for banks um, so by penalizing further banks for in a way parking their their funds to, uh, at the European Central Bank um, from 0 0.2 negative to 0 0.3 negative he uh, the president has really tried again to send the message that the money and the LOTRs and the all the the whole package is really supposed to not replace um, financial uh, and its financial um, policy from individual governments in the European Union but it's meant to really make sure that the money is not kept in the banks but is loaned out so that the banks are um, disadvantaged from uh, keeping the money sitting and are in a way stimulated into lending it so that businesses can uh, access vital funding for expansion and for um, rebuilding the economy so in a way uh, 
we have this uh, upgrade on Thursday. We've had it and it was out in the open. And yet this was the reaction from the Euro US dollar. Remarkable really. When you consider the um, impact that a QE program is under normal circumstances or in previous circumstances um, is meant to have on, on a currency uh, for that particular country. When you consider that um, the QE program in uh, Japan has been you know, at the base of carry trade from the pairs like the QE yen that we've been looking at earlier and how it has responded and uh, so with the dollar yen and other yen pairs certainly we have um, an element of surprise but as some would say this is a, a one-day move and we shouldn't be concerned about it true this one-day move didn't last very long as you can see on the Friday which was uh, the non-farm payrolls uh, release we didn't progress any further so actually it was a down day so in a way it does actually say to anybody reading the same chart that this move alone won't reverse something like the European central currency because its general outlook is not bullish its general outlook compared to the US dollar is not um, comparable because the US dollar has behind it not just the Federal Reserve Bank but a sustained economic growth of course the inflation target has not been met so the 2% target um, for the US has yet to be um, fulfilled in order for the central bank to be satisfied that um, you know progressing with uh, rate hikes and not only that but that the economy is on the right uh, pace for sustained growth that still hasn't happened but the unemployment is still at five percent as from the previous month's data uh, jobs um, are continue to be added to the economy and in fact they they beat expectations so certainly from the from from that point of view um, the data is encouraging for the Fed to go ahead with to progress with the uh, its um, promise of tightening its balance sheet. I like at this point just to briefly um, finish on the EURUSD by saying that the bigger picture really for the EURUSD is that Draghi, you know, from 2014 to early middle 2015 so in about a year the drop has been quite remarkable and he's managed to cheapen the euro to in a way help the um, exports and so in a way help um, the European Union in terms of uh, uh, recovery but also we um, with a cheaper euro we um, we see that we have come to levels which you know there's nothing here for years so in a way there are new lows since the highs preceding the uh, or during the financial crisis and to really see levels that are further below the 105 which was also um, a support at in 1997 we must go down to the 2000, 2001. Now here we've got, uh, certainly if we consider where we are, there is room to, to go down even further because if we take this peak at 140, we're roughly at the same peak as we were in the uh, 1995 year. So we can see that these two peaks okay have come a similar way and so far we could say there's nothing to stop the euro dropping further so we could come down to 0 0.85 0 0.90 okay now that would be remarkable and it would take a lot of drive to break through these levels uh, certainly reaching parity has been talked about for most of 2015 but it hasn't happened even as the euro was dropping here 
in early 2015 it stopped at 105 and the second leg from October September sorry August September it again stalled at 105 obviously there is a level of um, support at 105 that we that we must take into into account so in a way if we had a line here at 105 we could say that um, this was a very well respected level for a number of reasons whether uh, because there are orders sitting there or whether it's a technical level that you know has implications for a real economy like uh, the eurozone and therefore there may be the European Central Bank itself um, trying to uh, intervene on previous occasions and uh, maybe still in spite of introducing the QE um, not wanting the actual currency to drop further we don't know exactly but certainly if everybody's looking at this chart like we are now um, this will be noticeable and everybody will be aware that to break this 105 level um, something major must happen okay it could be an announcement it could be something unpredictable a black swan event but certainly we need to have the motivation for this pair which is heavily traded and very liquid so it doesn't um, usually speak to uh, big moves and in fact if we look at the ATR the average true range over a two week period okay you can see that uh, we are not particularly uh, high certainly the, the lowest point here was um, back in uh, July sort of the summer of 2014 and where we were at 38 um, sort of less than 40 pips per day on average then the ATR calculates the average based on open close and and so on so it's an average but it does give an idea of volatility therefore it's a it's a good proxy for uh, something like the VIX or certainly for, for volatility so you can see that volatility um, through the years for the Euro USD has picked up in places and dropped in others and we are down here to 104 pips so obviously this is the latest reading but it if you look at it it was a pickup based on the um, on Thursday so just prior to that we were down to 75 pips per day okay so in order to motivate something out of this um, range if you like and certainly um, past either 1.10 or below 1.5 so this 500 pip range it will take something remarkable and it may not happen in a day it may happen over a number of days but it certainly will take something remarkable now we do have an, a remarkable event and what's a, what's quite significant is that on the Friday the US dollar wasn't particularly motivated by the positive non-farm payrolls data and for two reasons the first reason being that um, the next event is very close so we have essentially next week um, with a number of high impact um, events on the, on the calendar and then the Wednesday following we have the Federal Reserve not only giving us what um, we expect to be a rate hike but possibly forward guidance as uh, as it's now known and this will really tell the markets what to anticipate going into 2016 and this is very important and the reason why I think the non-farm payrolls move compared to the one that we had in um, at the beginning of November which was very remarkable and indeed it broke the 12,200 just you know briefly but it certainly pushed the dollar up um, to those levels and then it didn't manage to break it after all but Certainly the, the positive data, the beta expectation as well as the previous count for jobs added to the economy, um, that time had more of an impact and this time it didn't particularly move the US dollar. Why? 
two reasons perhaps one the the market spent all of its moves on the previous day of the ECB rate decision and QE extension and perhaps this was a non-event although it did it did actually beat expectation um, it it wasn't higher than the previous count and um, certainly in itself the non-farm payrolls event at this particular point in time in these market conditions wasn't enough to push the dollar back to these highs at 12,200 and certainly um, we're now back to uh, more or less the levels of September these peaks okay so so in a way if the US dollar is uh, not uh, going to move particularly until we have the rate announcement on the 16th of December we can certainly expect the currency pairs like the euro US dollar uh, to struggle for follow-through on a move like this and really even more to break below 105 and stay there you know just not just a break but a follow through uh, into uh, a continuation of this bigger picture of a downtrend so we need really that event to get an answer as to where this will head to we've had this peak in uh, 95 so 20 years on two decades of uh, a big cycle you might say returning at these levels everybody likes cycles the, the problem is that um, like myself I know too well how cycles can disappoint and mathematics can go horribly wrong so we we, we can certainly uh, envisage looking at cycles and um, peaks that return in time and you know this peak here might also be said to be um, part of that and that's 10 years on so we have a very symmetrical um, set of uh, set of conditions that we may meet so where every time this peak is met we can consider what reaction we've had from there and the first time certainly it was a strong reaction to that peak uh, this time uh, 10 years on from 95 uh, it didn't continue further uh, much below 120 and then picked up um, so if you're an Elliott Wave fan you might say it's an A, B, C, D kind of move uh, or you might break it down into smaller waves A, B, C, D, E or whatever but the problem is that this really doesn't help us because we've broken below this so it's a different uh, shape altogether and certainly if you look at the uh, coming down to this 105 after the 95 peak there was a considerable pickup as you can see back to 1.25 this time round it struggled to even get to 1.20 so um, this part of the leg if you like is is different however this part of the leg if you break it down further uh, we had this move back in 97 to 98 okay actually 97 the late part of 97 going up to 1.15, uh, 1.16 and uh, so from that point of view we are in a very similar situation in fact if we added a, a line make it uh, there I will give it a different uh, uh, color so if we look at that line okay late 97 we have come to those levels um, earlier this year and the bounce has occurred okay now the next point would be to break above it and go up to these levels at 1.24 so we could have this as one possibility and the other possibility would be that this part would be missed out altogether and there'd be a continuation below 105 which may not happen as a straight line it may happen again like this but eventually coming down to 0 0.90 0 0.80 or somewhere in between those uh, that range 
that's that's really where we can look at a past cycle where there are similar shapes. Now the next thing to do would be to look at market conditions back in the 90s, what was happening then, um, look at the uh, European Central Bank. Now of course the um, situation then was pre-Euro, uh, the Euro came in 2001, so we, we know we don't have the actual single currency at this point, but we have a single market, the European Economic Area and European Union, so uh, various trade agreements and and although there wasn't a euro, but there was a, an economic uh, European Union uh, trading with the U US um, USA. So this chart must be read in that sense rather than as equivalent to the mechanism of price action post the introduction of the single currency in the European Union. So, but from a chart point of view, certainly there is a beauty in this uh, symmetry and it, it certainly speaks to us that something in this range must break either to the upside or the downside. Obviously, it can only go two ways, so it cannot stay trapped in here forever. And I think the event on the 16th of December will be something that will push the, the dollar and therefore or rather in response to uh, something like the Euro USD, but also the pound US dollar. Now the pound US dollar is a remarkable um, it's a remarkable chart really. If everybody were looking at this chart um, at the same time, and I've I've said this before, nobody would fail to notice that we have essentially three areas. Okay, two on either side, which are very symmetrical overall, although in the detail they're not, but overall they are symmetrical, and the central peak, if you like. Now, obviously, this is going back to uh, the mid to early 90s, so we are looking at, again, two decades worth of price action, and the market conditions within those 20 years have, you know, gone through several cycles. What's remarkable about this is that the uh, the levels are not just the the shape, but um, what is implied in the in the levels. So, if we had, for example, um, the the peak here at sitting at one seventy, roughly one seventy two, let's say, I prefer round numbers or the closest decimals. So. If we said, just for the sake of argument, um, that 170 was our peak here, okay, we've actually, you know, in the greater scheme of things, on a monthly chart of this scale, um, 200 pips or not, it is it isn't a big a big move. So let's sort of uh, discount the top 200 pips to keep it to a, a big round number like this. So 1.70, and at this end. 1.45. Okay, this is uh, okay. This is where we're at now. So we have these two uh, cycles, if you like, either side of this peak, and um, true to um, you know cycles, we have you know entered this range and returned to the bottom. In this particular instance, we don't have data before that on this chart, but it took from yeah, it took about seven years. Um, I I do uh, subscribe to the theory of seven-year cycles, and um, sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't. This one does clearly. So in seven years, we came up to the top of this what we are now calling a range, but essentially these two levels. Um, so two and a half thousand pips, okay, and then back down. Now this um, obviously broke a fair bit, okay. So 500 pips here, but um, again it was sort of breaking back up. So it was sort of gravitating around this uh, this level, you might say. Um, if we weren't happy with that, we could lower it a little bit and take it to 140. Okay, this will this will give us a three thousand pip range, 
rather than a two and a half. So let's make it that. This seems a bit better. So okay, now what we don't see is a, a range from here to here or a cycle, if you like. So in that case, um, it isn't. But what we do see, however, is that um, this level, the current level of 1.51, is important to us. So let's let's mark it as well. And if we had it at 150 rather than 51, to make it a round number, that might actually uh, help us. Right. Okay, I'll try to do this quickly. That's better. Okay, so 150 uh, is what we're looking for. And make it uh, darker. Okay, so this is where we are. And you can see that there are a number of interactions with this level, and quite major ones too. Uh, 96. Um, 2000, um, possibly 2010, certainly 2013, and then uh, now. So this is about sort of give or take a third of the way. In fact, it is a third of the way. Um, so this 3,000 pip range, um, the next level up would be 1.60, and we've been there already. So and we've bounced off it. So now we're heavily pressing against 150. Now the last time in this cycle, the last time this happened, um, there was a bounce, but this has already occurred. After the bounce and back to 170, coming down as we have done, we then finally broke this level. So if we went by a cycle, okay, uh, we could say that um, we are going to potentially break below okay and the break occurred in let's, uh, let's have a look here the break occurred in um, so um, 105 so the break occurred around this time in Okay, there was a first break in May 2000, and then finally the final break in August. Okay, so we're not actually even by month. We're not far from um, from that because it's December. And um, the remarkable thing about um, August certainly was the the flash crash, not the flash crash, but the uh, the crash provoked by the Chinese stock market. So on the 24th of August, if we can find it, that was that. Okay. So the 24th of August was there. Okay. On the 24th of August, this is what happened, and um, subsequent to that, there was a big drop, big drop from 158 to about 1.52, 600 pips within a few days. And then we had this, um, if you look at it from that point on, almost like a, a trend, down, a mini downtrend. And we have broken below 150. So on the day before the ECB rate decision, so on the Wednesday, uh, we had this, this break here, okay, or attempted break. And certainly it seems that, um, as far as I recall, it was a, a disappointment in uh, UK data. I think it was the PMI, construction PMI, that came out. And then uh, in the morning. So this down day was caused really by UK data. But it stopped just um, you know halfway between 1.49 and then it closed 1.4950. So it didn't really truly break 150. And then the next day we were back above it. So the pound US dollar is also another pair that's really waiting for the Fed on the 16th of December to make its move. And this will really help the cable as well because the pound has been plagued since the rush from two and back from 150 to 170, 72. Um, it's been plagued by its own uh, expectation 
of a rate hike and disappointment of that. And really what happens from July of 2013 when Carney was installed as the governor of the Bank of England. Coming from the Bank of Canada, he was the, uh, he'd, uh, with a good track record, he was seen as the superstar of, of the banking world and he was fated, you know, he was um, really a breath of fresh air. Um, Mervyn King had been serving uh, before him. Um, essentially, Carney brought with him a different approach, perhaps, but the, he had to deal with the, the economic situation in the UK, um, which uh, was in a way different from the Canadian model. And certainly um, also having to deal with the fact that um, as the head of the Bank of England, he um, had to also take into account that London um, is a centre for finance. And so uh, moves in the Bank of England are, um, you know, certainly very important to the markets generally, but the 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 economy in the UK and the, the finance world of, of the of the city of London, uh, the finance world of the stock market and and financial interests um, are not always easy bedfellows. So it is a, a difficult balancing game. And raising rates certainly for the Bank of England was always going to be a tricky corner. And when the uh, unemployment rate was set as a condition to be met, you know. I believe it was below um, seven percent, but um, I I might have to go back on that data. But certainly there was a point where the market saw this as when the unemployment reached those levels, um, you know, coming to these points, the the Bank of England's governor, the new governor, was really um, backed into a corner, and you know the in a way when 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 the bank had to admit that it wasn't going to raise rates after all uh, 2014 from the middle of 2014 and into 2015 we saw the consequence of when a central bank uh, in a way loses its credibility on something like um, monetary policy going forward into raising its central rate and it's a big deal because it affects a number of things, not just the real economy, but also um, equities and um, a lot of finance has been built over the years on stimulus. So we saw that with the S&P 500, we saw that with the FTSE 100, um, we saw that with the um, Nikkei 225 for Japan. So um, when the rate um, rise didn't occur, um, the pound was bludgeoned, it literally dropped from the sky. So the pound has been through its own one year cycle of euphoria, expectation and disappointment and you can see that the fall is always shorter and more brutal than, than the rise. You know, the time it took for this to drop um, 2000 and more pips was shorter than the time it took to rise. So. So where we are at the moment is that the Bank of England is, you know, it's been made clear in uh, in November through various uh, speeches and uh, the previous rate decision uh, is that the Bank of England isn't ready to raise rates, that uh, raising rates now uh, just wouldn't make sense. So the, the governor has been clear and Hal Dane, the chief economist for the Bank of England has been clear. Um, it isn't, uh, and also the vote from the, the Monetary Policy Commission has always been, you know, uh, pretty much unchanged uh, in terms of keeping the, the interest rate unchanged. So it's really not been. There's not been a shift in sentiment in the in the bank's own Monetary Policy Commi Committee. So we we don't really have at the moment a motivation for the pound to um, engage with the interest rate theme again, certainly not into the end of this year, and the economists are not really banking in a rate rise well into 2016, even 2017. On the other hand, economists are actually seeing a strong probability of the Federal Reserve Bank raising rates, and here we have the Chicago 
Mercantile Exchange website um, with a very handy countdown to the uh, Federal Reserve um, Committee giving us a breakdown of the probability of a rate hike. We have 21% of probability implied for a quarter of a point, uh, so 0.25, um, and for a half point, 0.5, is given at 79.1%. Okay, these are the sort of latest updates um, from the Fed Watch. So we have, um, obviously we have a strong expectation of a rate hike even at uh, half a point, okay, 0.5%. But what's remarkable is that towards the, um, you know, early in the year and coming towards the end of the year, there's been a shift. So where the, Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve was seeing as uh, raising rates, you know, more and more, um, there, there was a remarkable shift in the last month or two in terms of percentage of implied probability. Um, and so this really strong um, commitment or even belief, if you like, uh, or confidence that, that is going to happen now is um, certainly telling us that the market is ready this time around. So in a way the Fed uh, and Yellen have done a very a remarkable job at preparing the markets for this uh, uh, for this event. So there, there shouldn't be in a way any shocks to the system or at least there shouldn't be any uh, durable shocks to the system. There, there will be volatility uh, just like on a, a, a big non-farm payrolls uh, day but you know, multiply that by two because of the low liquidity conditions coming to the end of uh, the year uh, into late December. So we certainly will have moves on the day for the US dollar and the majors and other pairs as well and equities and anything that has exposure to, um, you know, money, essentially capital markets. So having said that, we, we do have um, to reflect on the fact that on the ECB day we had this move where the markets essentially rallied the uh, the euro and because there was an expectation for a uh, for the ECB to uh, continue its QE program and so if we had plans for the US dollar to rally on um, on, on Yellen coming out and saying the Federal Reserve will raise rates by a quarter of a point, 0.25% um, on the 16th of December. And then, for example, we had one or two scenarios and then one of them was that there would be no prospect of further rate increases announced on the day. Um, but that you know that there would be the possibility of, of more rate hikes into the into 2016 um, based on you know data. That would be possibly not enough to push the dollar to break these highs at 12,200. Okay. In fact, we could even see the dollar shake some of its premium off and drop considerably, just like we saw. We saw it happening in reverse with the euro rallying. So we must be careful to think that pairs like the pound USD would drop below 150 and take that as a given, or that the, uh, for example, the Kiwi dollar as well, which is another pair that I've been watching, uh, would um, break back below 0.65 and and to uh, to break this sort of long-term trend line and and below. Certainly, um, the Kiwi has its own troubles, but it's come to these uh, to this long, uh, some might say a bottom, or certainly this long end of a long-term bear trend, and it it has um, you know it has run a fair bit from these highs of 2011 and 2014. So it, it is in a way um, with improvement in 
in its conditions, the New Zealand uh, dairy trade has experienced a slight pickup on the last dairy trade auction in uh, in uh, Auckland. Um, so th there is actually some interest in, and also the the kiwi is actually still one of the highest yielding currencies. Um, and we have a rate decision coming up next week, but that rate decision, um, whether it's a, a rate cut to 2.5% or or a, a or a hold, certainly won't be a, a rate hike. But um, you know the market could take this as a non-event with the Fed Reserve uh, rate decision coming up the following week. So we must be careful to have too much expectation of that event. However, if the markets are already front-running the Fed rate decision and giving it uh, that high degree of probability, uh, as we saw at even 79% uh, for a 0.5 increase, then um, it could be that there would be some positioning already happening for the Kiwi um, on a neutral Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate decision on the 9th. And possibly trying to imply that the Fed rate hike is already a given, the Kiwi could pick up. Whether it will break the 200-day moving average at 0.69 remains to be seen. Um, we have one or two problems at the moment. The volatility will not be uh, will not be shy coming to these events, um, but what we are missing is liquidity, obviously, and the two go hand in hand in a reverse correlation. So if we don't have the liquidity, we have big moves because there isn't the the market size to, uh, in a way, to moderate those moves. But um, if we have liquidity, obviously, we can also sustain moves over time. So if we had an uptrend, uh, liquidity would help us sustain that trend. Um, with a big move, for example, from the Kiwi in the next week and a half up to this 200-day moving average, what we would be lacking would be the liquidity perhaps to implement buy orders of a magnitude that would break the 200-day moving average, which although it's a lagging indicator, we can see that we've been below it since August of 2014. And the market participants um, at various levels do if any uh, indicator is used, uh, at least I'm told, but it's the 200-day moving average, as a, as a, a, in a way, a gauge of market sentiment. Because if if this is the one that uh, institutions even, or certainly hedge funds, or if this is a recognised in a way, a gauge of sentiment, and we broke this in 2014 and not been above it since. Uh, that's over a year of being under it. This could mean one of two things: one that it's a uh, there isn't enough, uh, you know, participation to the upside of buyers uh, wanting to, to have a, a higher valued kiwi. That includes the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, by the way, who has the power to move things up to a point, and certainly they've been talking the currency down in the last year and very successfully so. I mean the perfect combination has been the wording of uh, not just saying that they wanted the currency to be lower but saying that it was unsustainable, unjustified, undesirable and then backed up with action. Uh, a series of rate cuts from the Reserve Bank, Bank of New Zealand ensure that the markets paid attention to the wording and so a combination of the two has helped the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the economy of New Zealand to cheapen the exports by lowering the value of the Kiwi US dollar uh, to the current levels that we see. Now we are sort of stuck in this range between 65 and uh, 67. So um, we've been there quite a long time back in July, August. We've re-entered it and we've not really broken above it significantly because we've returned within it uh, bar this current peak um, above it but we're still within its influence so um, we've been in that area for over 
you know, a year and a half, you might say. And therefore, it's it's quite obvious that we need to have a resolution of this. And a resolution can only come with um, a combination of the Reserve Bank New Zealand rate decision, but essentially, fundamentally, it will be the the Federal Reserve meeting. What's the um, the other scenario that I was I was mentioning uh, in passing was that the Federal Reserve will also announce a further rate hikes. So as part of its tightening policy, it will basically say to the markets, not only do we intend to raise rates just now, but we also intend to raise rates further into next year. Now this is really important because if this is, an, is, is a non-event, in essence, with the markets already having prepared for this event for months, um, certainly, although, you know, until the words are pronounced by Yellen, there will be a rate hike, um, it, it is expected, certainly, we saw that high degree of probability from the markets. So, if we did have the rate hike, but also we backed it up with um, some degree of confidence going forward, that the pace of the economic recovery in the United States and um, the stability of the banking system, the lack of um, worry for a uh, housing bubble developing. Um, if indeed we had um, forward guidance saying that the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, after raising rates, will continue to implement raised uh, hikes throughout 2016. This would actually have not just the effect of um, bolstering the US dollar and pushing currencies like the Kiwi and the, the pound and the euro down. This would also have the important element of making the US dollar once again uh, what I suppose the uh, gold uh, would have been. Um, which is the the reserve, the safe haven, or the reserve, uh, the funding for safe investment. So far, we've seen that the um, equities index, the S and P 500, has had um, a, a run that we could certainly uh, see in the chart for the S and P 500, and this run is certainly troubled and from Yellen's own words it's a frothy market and the equities index certainly come uh, a long way from 2009. So we've had a, a six year run, six and a half year run, uh, with its pullbacks, uh, remarkably this one in 2011. And but since it's not been challenged, and what's remarkable is that if we compare the FTSE 100 index, okay, and you can see as I was uh, mentioning, uh, it's it's got itself into a situation where uh, we have, and this is a very long-term chart, so this is going back to the 90s. Now the first peak in um, 2001 or 2000 2001 then the peak of 2007 2008 and the peak of 2014 15 so um, these approximate seven year cycles okay are essentially wedged between uh, a range okay and what's remarkable is that this is a quite symmetrical cycle because not only does it sustain a seven-year period, but it also sustains uh, a peak each time. That's you know plus minus a couple of hundred pips, but it's more or less in the same region. Whereas the S&P 500, after the first two cycles, uh, equivalent to the ones in the um, UK 100, has really shot up. So we are in in time in a similar cycle, but in terms of value. Um, we have come nominally to something of a, a misnomer because there's nothing equivalent beho beforehand 
to give us um, an idea of recurring levels or zones or anything like that. So we don't know yet what happens from here and of course we can never tell what happens in the markets but certainly this is um, a big uh, it's a big unknown and what's remarkable about this is that the um, the crash that happened in in uh, in August unnerved the markets the Chinese market crash was a surprise and then the talk started from here on about China being in uh, uh, in not in a recession but certainly in a slowing down in terms of GDP and production and um, so this drop from the 2100-2200 area has since been uh, recovered but we're now stuck in this area and there, there's nothing really that has moved uh, North Farm payrolls hasn't moved it uh, data from the US hasn't moved it um, various events uh, Paris attacks um, terrorism geopolitical concerns um, the OPEC meeting uh, this week so it's not really moved from these highs and if we look at where we've come from the beginning of 2015 okay we're basically back to these levels more or less that really paints a picture of coming to a point where if the US dollar became the investment currency uh, appreciating through value and interest and with the backing of uh, a strong recovery in the US economy attracting confidence from investors attracting uh, capital attracting um, in a way a truer sense that a currency um, and an economy going hand in hand so stronger uh, recovery in the economy and a stronger currency this could really play against something like the S&P 500 so all the financial build up into engineering this move on debt and borrowed money from easy money from the stimulus from the central from the Federal Reserve Bank coming to an end um, on the need for long-term investors and long-term built-up positions that have been in a way protected by this um, asset purchase program from the Fed this coming to an end uh, could generate a fear reaction and this could really escalate and as we saw in the October flash crash um, sorry in the August uh, so-called Black Monday so something like this would really um, take a very short time this was a um, 2500 pip move um, this this didn't take long at all to to generate so it could take weeks or it could take days but this could come down 10 20 percent possibly more and then a combination of the end of the year and uh, squaring the books as they call it uh, end of the year and um, possibly we could see that continuing into early 2016 into January and you know basically uh, rinsing out debt and accumulated positions at these levels to return to more quote-unquote normal levels okay which could be even below these peaks even down to to these now obviously I'm not advocating that one should go short here and expect it to go down to these levels okay back to the uh, 2009 low but certainly we have the potential for some kind of drop that at the moment is certainly open for any scale that we want it to be um, and if the US dollar became the funding currency it would be certainly um, something that the Fed would um, engineer through forward guidance by reassuring new investment so investment out of equities for example and into the US dollar that uh, the Fed would um, you know still by monitoring the recovery and uh, job and uh, inflation data but you know if the Fed gave enough forward guidance to reassure 
investment into US dollar based assets, um, then there could be a sort of move into strong um, US dollar uh, appreciation against a number of things, including obviously the euro, the pound, the kiwi, etc. So I think that that really covers where we are at the moment. And we have these events next week, like the uh, Bank of England uh, rate decision and other events, like the Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate decision. Uh, but certainly, I would say that um, these these are events that will certainly help digesting the events of this week, uh, the ECB rate decision and so on. But we don't really have the conviction until the uh, Federal Reserve Bank will pronounce itself on on its own uh, destiny, if you like. And so I would like to conclude by really showing you the, uh, the calendar for the coming week. And I think there's possibly um, a need to, uh, to make sure that we are updated with what's coming up. So from next week, you can see that we have the uh, Chinese uh, trade balance on Tuesday. Uh, we have the UK manufacturing production. Uh, we have the CPI from China Wednesday. Um, so the first thing in the morning in European hours and then at the end of Wednesday again European hours GMT 8 o'clock in the evening the Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate decision which is expected to be cut from 2.75 to 2.5 so this again could have a medium impact in a short term certainly on the Kiwi and then the next day the interest rate decision for the pound followed by on Friday retail sales PPI for the US dollar and then industrial production on the Saturday. And then, of course, this will lead us nicely into the following week for the uh, Fed rate hike. It's also worth remembering that the um, currency pair of pound kiwi is something that, if you are interested in um, you know, these two events coming up next week, the pound and the Kiwi will obviously be influenced by the two rate decisions back to back. So um, this is the monthly chart. You can see that this long channel, I'll take off the uh, uh, overlay. Okay, this is the channel that I'm showing you from the monthly chart. And you can see that um, 2001 peak, seven years later, 2008 peak, seven years later, 2015 peak. So we've uh, we've bounced off that, and we're now into this um, situation where essentially we are um, in a this this candle from November has failed uh, to to really push the currency higher and retreated all the way back from um, the high of 2.36 retreated all the way down to 2.30 and closed at 2.28 okay 800 pips so now we've opened and there's been a, a long descent here so uh, we're definitely below 230 again from the from the April run March April we came up all the way this was the month of the Chinese market crash well, we had a move above 1,100 pips, if I remember right, on the day, the 24th of August. And then this huge wick reflects that particular day's move rather than the whole month. So this candle really uh, didn't come above the, the channel top. We do, however, seem to have a number of things happening here because if the pound were to be unmoved, sorry, if the Bank of England were not to move on interest rates on the Wednesday next week, on the Thursday next week, um, we would certainly see the pound suffering because that would be, again, just a continuation of recent uh, downgrading of sterling. If the day before 
in fact hours before, uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand were to uh, cut rates and then the next day the pound were to keep rates unchanged, we could have either a reversal of this candle and a push back up. With the pound keeping rates unchanged, the move back up could be short-lived. Also, we must remember that we don't have enough liquidity in the system, so any move that requires further conviction could struggle. And on top of that, we have the Fed uh, rate decision coming up after. So certainly we do have to bear in mind that although there are, for a currency pair like this, uh, there's double the event risk and it could be aligning into one direction. Let's say Reserve Bank of New Zealand cuts rates and the pound keeps rates unchanged and perhaps introduces the element of um, the votes, the nine members of the um, Monetary Policy Committee changing from, say, 8 to 1, keeping uh, rates unchanged, to perhaps, you know, 7 to 3 or 6 to 4. That, combined with the uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate cut, could certainly um, help the pound um, and punish the, the Kiwi. So we need something like that uh, rather than just the Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate cut because that is already being expected. So again, at these levels, um, which, you know, coming from these 195, 197 to where we are, there is still room to the downside and we've come off this long-term trend channel top. So um, indeed we have the potential for, say, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand cuts rates but doesn't announce for the rate cuts into 2016 or the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, doesn't cut rates, that certainly would be uh, positive for the Kiwi and so negative for the pound Kiwi. But anyway, this is a currency pair that I've been trading uh, to the long side for the long term, so I'm, um, I'm prepared for further depreciation, but certainly um, I see this as long term appreciating because this bottom here um, has built up very quickly to the upside, then corrected slightly, but I think it's, it is, uh, at least technically, uh, motivated to further appreciation to these levels at 3,000. The channel top has held so far, but eventually, you know, any channel or trend line will, uh, will break, so this could be a time where this is indeed a the right condition with the right conditions it could break um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that on a technical level again on the daily chart we see that we've been stuck in this sort of thousand pit range and we have broken it but just underneath we have the 200 day moving average and as I said before this is a gauge for sentiment and as long as we stay above it as we have been since the break in April um, we can at least be reassured that there isn't enough conviction to break it for a number of reasons and whatever they are uh, we can uh, we can say that this one staying above the 200 day moving average wins over a line in drawn like this like the trend channel line so or certainly that um, you know correcting back up off the 200 day moving average could imply that there is still interest long in this pair. Now the pound uh, kiwi is an interesting pair because some of the moves have been motivated by the kiwi appreciating recently, but also occasionally it's kind of there's been a switch to uh, when the kiwi hasn't moved particularly. It's there's been a switch to the uh, the pound weakness. So on the release of weak pound data uh, early this week. Um, we certainly had a response on the day from this currency to the pound data uh, and so there is occasionally the question that comes to mind which is how would 
this hybrid pair, this synthetic pair, react to the Fed rate hike. For example, if the Kiwi were to respond negatively, as well as the pound, obviously the cable, respond negatively to the US dollar. So the two parent pairs would be the, the Kiwi dollar and the pound dollar. So the two pairs might simultaneously drop. What would happen at that point? If they both dropped against the US dollar um, appreciating, would this, um, you know, if the Kiwi is dropping, then this pair by default should appreciate because the, the relationship to the um, Kiwi dollar is the leading relationship. The correlation is basically um, it's it's almost 100 um, percent and it's going back you know the entire year has been a, a positive inverse correlation to the Kiwi dollar rather than to the pound dollar. So if the Kiwi dropped heavily um, this pair would or should appreciate but if the pound also dropped um, and we've seen recent bouts of uh, switching correlations to the the pound US dollar in times of market conditions that are uh, highly volatile and unpredictable who is to say that this pair with the Kiwi dropping and the pound dropping wouldn't just drop regardless uh, or rather wouldn't redouble its drop feeding off the uh, depreciation of the pound as well as the Kiwi. Conversely if the uh, if say that the Fed rate uh, didn't happen, which is very unlikely, but you know you can never discount it, then what might happen is that the dollar obviously would plummet, um, and it would certainly be. I think that's that's a given. The dollar would be would be suffering um, straight away. There would be a very unequivocal and unilateral uh, dollar short reaction. At least that that seems to be the, the logical conclusion, but we can never say that. Um, but certainly, if the dollar did drop, then would the kiwi appreciate? Yes. But would the pound appreciate? Maybe. The pound's own interest rate credential has been very low, so um, the sustainability of a pound move to the upside is less credible than a sustainability of a kiwi move to the upside. So. If the pounds appreciated with the US dollar dropping, um, it may not drive this pair more than the Kiwi appreciating. In which case, it seems to me that, um, in spite of my uh, bullish, sort of hawkish leaning, this currency pair is troubled at the moment because the, the correction we had from these 246 highs to 225, so uh, over 2000 pips. Uh, leading into the short leg up back to 235 has been you know not strong enough to continue its long-term uptrend from April so it seems to me that long term this could be continuing higher but in the immediate we have certainly potential for further depreciation and certainly the, the breach of the 200 day moving average would be one to watch. So I have to really uh, say that waiting for the next week uh, and the following week uh, is at this point essential to really gauge into the future what will happen because we don't have a clear reading yet. Um, we are across this 225 level, we're above the 200 day moving average, the pound is uh, pressing on that 150 level um, here, so we certainly have, you know, all these strong and important levels are being tested, but we haven't moved away from them or through them. So, so here we need conviction. We need the U.S. Um, the Federal Reserve to pronounce itself once and for all and put the markets at ease coming to the end of the year. I hope you uh, enjoyed the video and have a great weekend and my next video will probably be after the 
Bank of England and Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate decisions, and and then uh, we'll see what the what those will bring to the table. Thank you very much for listening, and happy trading.